a rousing end to a raucous day one here in Philadelphia, back here in the Wells Fargo Center, where day two of the Democratic National Convention is upon us, joined by my panel of all-star analysts to break down uh, a fascinating opening day of this convention and look ahead to night two, joined now by Democratic strategist Liz Smith, political contributor and former communications director for Tim Kaine, Linda Tran, and Megan Serra, the battleground states director for the Clinton campaign, uh, where this figure is to be won. Uh, <laughs> Meg, before I get to uh, your particular part then uh, of the business, we just looked uh, at some of the highlights uh, from a day that started rather chaotically, uh, I think, for the for the party, uh, for the campaign, but ended with a standing ovation as Bernie Sanders left that stage. As you look back then on what we saw yesterday, what would you make of it? Well, we thought it was an incredible first start to, the, um, to our convention and a powerful contrast to the divisiveness and uh, dysfunction that we saw last week in Cleveland. Um, we saw, you know, um, Senator Sanders and others coming together, a really strong unity message, uh, but also optimism and hope, which we know that voters are looking for. Had you anticipated the response, especially earlier, though, in the evening when his supporters very fervently uh, were shouting down speakers, uh, required some massaging from uh, some of his uh, supporters at the microphone earlier in the day. In fact, we'd seen uh, Bernie Sanders booed by his own supporters, as he said uh, that he would like them to support Hillary Clinton and Tim Kaine. Um, did that initial reaction then surprise you, albeit one that we really didn't hear when he said that Hillary Clinton must become the next president of the United States in the speech? Yeah, I would say that, you know, primaries are intense. They're designed to be that way. And, you know, I personally think that our party is stronger um, because of the, um, you know, the intense and really purposeful, but also policy driven debate that mm -hmm. we've had. And people feel strongly and that's to be expected. Uh, but what we saw coming out of the night was um, really strong uh, messages of unity and also just what's at stake with this election. So, I, you know, I think we ended the night um, strong and really coming together. It was something he did acknowledge as well, saying that this was democracy. This, yeah. Is, yeah. this is the creative tension. And just to piggyback off of what um, Meg said, look, most people don't watch the conventions live, right? And they, how they see it is on the front page of their newspapers. And I think what's important is earlier in the day, we thought maybe the front pages would say disunity, booze. But it ended up being headlines about... Sanders' rousing speech about Michelle Obama's rousing speech. And that's really what matters because most Americans probably weren't tuning in live. And so I think that's the most important thing that came out of it yesterday. Well, I, uh, personally, I would actually argue that tuning in live as well right here is also important. <laughs> so feel we free, have tuning feel free in to live. marinate in all sorts of media. I want to get to your then particular part of, of the business. Recent polls, Meg, have shown a tight race between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump in key battleground states, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, numbers that uh, seemingly surprise a lot of folks when they look at numbers uh, speaking to individual uh, candidates. What do you make of uh, what look to be dead heats within the margin of error in those states? Yeah, um, it's exactly right. We're absolutely not taking anything for granted um, and know that we've got a lot of work to do between now and November. Um, you know, what we're seeing is that um, people um, are looking for change and also um, looking for a powerful vision for this country that's going to look out for them. Um, you know, we believe that Sec Secretary Clinton can provide that, but we've really got to put the, the time and the work in, um, particularly on the ground, talking with voters to talk about what's at stake, uh, but also to motivate and mobilize voters to come out. Um, so it's both about making a choice between Trump and Secretary Clinton, uh, but also, I think, the, the choice to vote versus not to vote. Yeah, garnering that Obama coalition is something that uh, is paid uh, a, a much attention. And yet, the demographics suggest perhaps it'll be there, but we we were talking about this all day yesterday. This is going to be a turnout election. So how are you specifically going to go about the business of getting people to the ballot boxes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, what we do see is that support levels are very, very high mm -hmm. with African Americans, with Latinos, uh, with women and young voters. Uh, but what we need to do is to make sure that first and foremost, they can vote. So we've got a very robust voter registration program happening um, in many of our battleground states, uh, but also things like uh, taking advantage of early vote um, in the states that we have them so that folks have more time um, and an easier experience getting to the polls. Yours is certainly a data-driven campaign. And as uh, the battleground uh, states director, I wonder your initial reaction when uh, the Trump campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, uh, seemed to reimagine the idea of 
the swing state, the battleground state, saying that there may be as many as 20 in play, referring specifically uh, to states such as Connecticut and Oregon, which I think it's fair to say, Drew, took a lot of people by surprise. <laughs> Uh, well, first and foremost, you know, we're running a 50 state strategy. So we have staff in all uh, 50 states, uh, DC as well. And, um, you know, part of that comes from the secretary herself, who really believes that this is an opportunity to build the infrastructure of the Democratic Party. So that's something that we're taking seriously. In terms of the Battleground States program, we're really focused on um, a similar set of states that we saw in 2008 and 2012. There are some differences in terms of demographic changes um, and also particular appeal that we see for Secretary Clinton. Uh, but we're focused on a core set of states that we think are going to be the most efficient pathway to 270. The campaign has had uh, struggles uh, dealing with the numbers, the unfavorable numbers uh, specific to the candidates. Uh, uh, trustworthy uh, trustworthiness and honesty uh, numbers. What then, if this is in part a four-day optical event, it is about the crafting of a narrative. To have it begin with uh, the revelations contained in the emails of the of the hacked emails from the from the DNC. Did you feel like it, it put you in something of a hole that you had to dig your way out of? You know, I think we've got a great plan here. And what we see is that um, Secretary Clinton is one of the most well-known individuals, um, particularly politicians in the world, but that actually folks don't know a lot about her and in particular her accomplishments. And the convention is a really powerful way to tell that story. Um, you know, tonight's theme is really about putting children and families first, which has been a theme for her entire career. And as a mom myself, uh, with two very small kids, um, that's something that speaks to me. And we're going to hear powerful testimony to that, both from elected leaders, but also, you know, regular everyday folks like you and me um, that we think will make a difference for voters. And a third on the way, we should mention, you know, <laughs> so, an early mazel to you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, as a, from the standpoint of what has now taken a turn perhaps better left to a spy novel, uh, that we now know that U.S. intelligence officials uh, do believe that it, was a, that it was Russia and Russian intelligence agencies responsible for uh, the hack. It had been the working hypothesis of the FBI, which is why they began the investigation in the first place. From a political and a security standpoint, what does it say that a foreign agent could potentially have the impact that this has had to this point on this election? Yeah, I'd say it's very, very concerning, um, you know, to have the potential of a foreign government interfering in an American election. And that's why we're, um, you know, very happy to hear that the FBI is investigating and I think are deeply concerned, like many others, about, uh, you know, what prompted this, what caused it, and, and ultimately how it happened. They said when uh, the emails were uh, dropped by WikiLeaks that this was going to be part one. Uh, are you concerned about a part two? You know, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I think the whole thing is very concerning. You know, ultimately, we're very focused on our Battleground States program. And I think um, average everyday people um, are really thinking about kind of, you know, their families, their economic livelihood. And we're focused on having those conversations. But obviously, we're going to follow the investigation closely. Linda, Liz, I appreciate the studio audience here. For my, uh, <laughs> I, I actually have a question for Meg, yeah, if, quickly, if I may. Quickly. So um, what's, what's, how is organization going to come into play, given your expertise in that area and the contrast between the Trump and Clinton campaigns? Sure. It's a great question. I mean, we really see that the ground game is one of our core advantages and one that we're leaning into. Um, so following the April 26th primaries, um, as I mentioned before, we put staff in all 50 states, but in our battleground states have really invested in a robust organizing program um, that we think is going to be really critical because we know that um, voters are influenced by their neighbors and peers. And so having those everyday conversations on the phone, but particularly at the door, in the living room, um, through things like a house meeting, uh, just this week um, alone, we've got uh, watch parties happening across the states um, in homes, in bars, and you know, you name it, different places where folks can not only watch the speeches, but really talk about them. And that's what we found really makes the difference. Quickly, Meg, one Republican official in Cleveland told me that essentially uh, that using the word campaign to describe uh, the Donald Trump campaign is being generous, that essentially they have <laughs> a candidate, an advanced team, and a Twitter feed. Does the lack of a traditional, a conventional ground game on the part of the GOP. Does it surprise you? 
look, I'm not going to comment on their campaign strategy um, and what they're doing with their resources. Uh, but we do have a lot of pride in terms of what we're doing, um, in particular, um, our ability to engage just a lot of volunteers that we think will take an active role on this campaign, uh, but hopefully future campaigns to come. Megan, Sarah, we appreciate you got a big few months ahead of you uh, <laughs> for any number of reasons. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much.